Hello everyone, it's Seiji and today I will be talking about a Uruguayan classic, namely Who Among Us by Mario Benedetti. But before I get into the book, I would just like to give you a little bit of background information on the author. Mario Benedetti was a Uruguayan writer and journalist who is considered to be one of the most important writers of Latin America in the 20th century. And he was also part of Generación del 45 or just Generation 45. This was a Uruguayan literary group that consisted mainly of writers who started their careers between 1945 and 1950. The group is known for having a notable influence on Uruguayan literature as well as culture at the time. And you know, surprisingly, Benedetti isn't very well known amongst English-speaking readers. Which is a shame, of course, but also makes me very excited for this video, so let's talk about Who Among Us. I guess you could say that this is a novella, it has about 100 pages, and so it's a very easy and quick read. It centers around this love triangle. You have Miguel and Alicia who fall in love as teenagers. But this dynamic gets challenged when Lucas enters the story. He is an enigmatic and charismatic teenager. And so Miguel believes that he will eventually lose Alicia to him. Against all odds, however, Alicia decides to marry Miguel. Fast forward two kids and 11 years later and their marriage isn't the best and so Alicia finds herself seeking out Lucas again. In this book all three characters get to explain their side of the story. I thought that this book was really good. It's definitely one of those where I felt that I didn't grasp everything completely. Definitely the first part in which Miguel explains his part of the story. So it's a book I hope to return to in the future. Anyway, there is so much to enjoy in this story. I absolutely love the fact that this had multiple viewpoints. Knowing that I'd read multiple interpretations of situations really kept me on my toes. And so I didn't immediately consider what the narrator at the time was saying as absolute. There's this lovely quote by Robert Evans I feel really embodies the essence of the story. There are three sides to every story, your side, my side and the truth and no one is lying, memories shared serve each differently. It's such an accurate description of how we interpret past events and so it's always very enjoyable to read a story in such a format. The book is split into three parts. The first is a series of confessionals from Miguel, in which he tries to analyse himself as well as his relationship with Alicia and Lucas. The second part is a letter that Alicia has written to Miguel, and the last part is a piece of fiction written by Lucas that was inspired by his relationship with Alicia and Miguel. The last one also contains loads of footnotes to discern fiction from reality. Miguel's section was really interesting. He actually has quite a depressing view of both himself and the world. He sees himself as a sort of second tier person, but also doesn't view a lot of other people being above that tier. He's incredibly indifferent and goes throughout life relegating himself to a secondary role, even in his own life. For me, it was very interesting to see how he almost tirelessly analysed himself. It also seemed like he projected his own inferiority complex onto others, and so I became extremely keen on learning about both Alicia's and Lucas's experiences. From the start, Miguel wasn't really a character that I could necessarily connect well with, but I was nevertheless willing to grant him the validity of his views. That was the case, however, up until the last chapter, in which he actually challenges his own intentions of writing this entire analysis. It turns out that he wasn't as truthful as he had previously led on to be. At the end, he admits to failing to mention a particularly crucial piece to his entire analysis, and that for me really was the nail in the coffin. I started viewing him with a very skeptical eye. And to be honest, I actually quite liked the way Benedetti did this, because I ended up feeling rather slighted towards the end of his part. And so I became even more eager to get Alicia's opinion on Miguel, and her part put the entire situation into 
perspective so well. For instance, Miguel in his part mentions that Elisha felt that he was incredibly egotistical, but from reading his confessionals, he didn't really come across like that. But then when Elisha's part came, then I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I can, I can definitely see why you felt that he was that way. And that's because Miguel's pessimism and indifference are accompanied by this sense that his views are absolute. He feels that his interpretations of people's actions and lack of actions are the only ones that exist. It's as if he refuses to consider his perception as subjective and acts upon it as fact. And as a result, he ruins what Alicia felt could be the best thing in their lives. My dearest, our marriage has not been a failure, but something far more terrible a misspent success. I wasn't expecting all three accounts to come in different literary forms, but I felt that they had their own quality and served their own purpose. I felt that Miguel's intimate account balanced very well with Alicia's matter-of-fact letter, and that Miguel's piece of fiction concluded the story neatly. I also really liked how Lucas's part added some humour to the story. Some of the footnotes really gave me a chuckle. For instance, here when his fiction self experiences this. All at once he got a taste of cold tobacco and so relit his cigarette. And then the footnote says, check this, as I've never smoked, I don't know if tobacco has a cold taste. <laughs> like what? Besides that, it's just very interesting to see how he criticizes his own work and himself in the footnotes. So yeah, I just thought that that was a great way of portraying Lucas's side. Also, after having read all three accounts, it was very clear to me that both men clearly did not understand Alicia and I felt that that was like the most tragic thing about this because she just seemed like she was surrounded by idiots. One thing that I felt was very noticeable was that all three characters in some way, shape or form wrote their part in a way that sort of served themselves. For instance, I felt that there was a lot of truth to what Alicia said, but there were some parts in Miguel's account that made Alicia come across as somewhat questionable, but she never mentioned those things in her own letter. But you know what? I don't think that that's the point. It's not the point of deciding who is right or wrong. Life is messy and complicated and things can go wrong in a thousand different ways. But one thing it never fails to do is be interesting. Also, one last thing that I wanted to note is that I really liked how Benedetti used time to his advantage in this book. It's only at the very end of the story that you realise in what order the accounts were written and that kind of like completely turns the story upside down and I just thought that that was really cool. It definitely strengthened the book for me. Having read this story, I am still so puzzled as to why Benedetti is still so unknown within the English literary scene. And it's definitely not due to the lack of material because he wrote more than 80 books. Either way, Penguin Classics still has published another piece of his work, which is called Springtime in a Broken Mirror. The book centers around Santiago, who is a political prisoner in Uruguay. He was jailed after a military coup, which led to many of his comrades fleeing. Feeling trapped, Santiago writes letters to his family to keep from going insane. At the same time, his nine-year-old daughter Beatrice wonders at the marvels of 1970s Buenos Aires, while her grandfather and mother, thus Santiago's wife, struggle to adjust to life in exile. I'm actually very interested in this novel, especially because Benedetti himself was exiled from Uruguay for 12 years. He spent time in Peru, Cuba and Spain whilst his wife had to stay back in Uruguay to take care of both of their mothers. Anyway, that's everything I had to say with regards to Who Among Us. Before I go, I would actually like to recite the last poem that Benedetti actually dictated to his secretary before he passed away. My life has been a fraud, my art has consisted in this not being noticed too much. I've been as a levitator in my old age, the brown sheen of the tiles never came off my skin. 
thank you very much for watching if you like my content perhaps consider joining my patreon i run a monthly diverse classics book club on there um, you can also just support me by subscribing and liking this video anyway um, i already said this but again thank you very much for watching and i hope to see you in another video bye bye and he was also known for being part of Gene Generation. <laughs> and he was also known for being part of Generation del Qu Quant. <laughs> Wait, let me. <laughs> 45 in Spanish. Qu Qu <laughs> 45. Wait, no. 45. Yes, or Generation 45. <laughs>